my wife always being the support that she is, pointed out that two of the babies had already gone to sleep and asked me would that be the first two people ever slept while I was preaching. No. Thank you for your participation in worship. And I hope you did view even our, our baby dedication as a time of worship. A time to honor God and to look to the future and to what God expects of us in our lives. I want to ask you a question this morning. It's a personal question for you to just answer to yourself. What does living the Christian life mean to you? When do you know that you are living a Christian life? What is it that you do or think? What's a Christian? There are a lot of opinions about that out there in the world today. Some people think it's simply being a good person, being honest and having integrity and working hard and taking care of your responsibilities. Some people view being a Christian as being faithful to certain religious activities such as coming to church or, or participating in the Lord's Supper, being baptized. Uh, that's the Christian life. For some people, it's practicing Christian or spiritual disciplines like reading your Bible and praying or fasting or uh, special service to others. That's the Christian life. For some people, it's simply not doing what you feel like doing. You know, being nice. Thinking in your mind, I can't stand you, but smiling and saying, oh, you're so precious. I believe there's a lot of confusion and a lot of frustration in our churches because we don't know what we're about. And I think if the church is going to really move forward, we're going to have to all agree on what we're about and get busy being about that. Now, I don't think you can accomplish that task by everybody just talking to each other. Let's all just throw in our opinions and see if we can figure it out. I think the best way, as a matter of fact, I think the only way to know what we're about is to look into God's Word and to see what Scripture tells us living the Christian life really is. I'm going to start in uh, chapter 3 of Philippians today, uh, chapter four, or, or chapter 3, verse 4b, and you may wonder, well, why is he starting in the middle of a verse? Well, in the original Bible, there were no verse numbers. There were just words. There's no punctuation marks, as a matter of fact. And um, uh, verse 4 of this chapter it starts continuing a previous sentence, and that sentence stops in the middle of this ver verse, and a new sentence starts. So I'm going to start where this new sentence starts in the middle of verse 4, and I read through verse 14. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on 
so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I think to get the full impact of this passage that I just read, you need to know some things about this letter that contains this passage. The key verse of this letter is chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. The theme of this letter is living with joy in the Christian life in spite of your circumstances. And it might be a good thing to know that Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter about how to live with joy. This portion of the letter that I just read is part of Paul's personal testimony about the change that occurred in his life when he came to know Jesus as Savior. Now, there are other places in the Bible where he tells about the details of that experience. He doesn't even mention that here. He just talks about what happened to him. It's not about a change in activities or habits. It's not about a change of values or purpose, or it is about a change of his values and his purpose. It's not an external change, it's an internal change. And he begins his testimony describing his life before Christ. Before Paul knew Christ, he was on his way to stardom. Now, Jackie and I had a friend in college who was a couple years older than us, I haven't told her I was going to mention him. She'll instantly know who I was talking about when I tell you a little about him. He was in his junior year, getting ready to graduate pretty soon, and he was still living in high school. He was still remembering his glory days. All he could talk about was what happened in high school and, and the people he hung out with and what he did. And, and it caused him problems sometimes getting along with the people in college and moving forward in his life because he just couldn't forget all those things. The bad part was his glory days weren't all that glorious to anybody but him. Paul, on the other hand, really did have some glory days. He, he was the top student in the top school of Pharisees in the whole world. When Paul walked into a room, people noticed him. They offered him the seat of honor. They wanted to be his friend. They wanted him on, on, the, on his good side. Paul had real power, and his power was growing. Now, Paul didn't talk about these things to impress people, to, to show them how good he was. He wanted people to understand he had let go of some things that were very precious to him. Things that he had literally spent his entire life working to attain, and he had just given them up completely. And the message that he's communicating to us today is that letting go is not a necessity for Paul only. It's a necessity for anyone who wants to genuinely follow Jesus Christ. If you want to follow Christ, you're going to have to let go of some things, and there are going to be some things that you have cherished, that you have valued and nurtured. It may be your glory days from the past. That's often true with churches. It may be the way we've always done it, which is even more often true of churches. But it may be resentment about something. It may be comfort. It may be a feeling of entitlement. But you see, letting go is not just something you do once when you come to know Jesus as Savior. It's an ongoing process that you continually do if you want to be able to know and do His will. And whatever it might be in your life, Paul is getting ready to proclaim that we must let go of our old lives in order to follow Christ to the fullest. 
So he tells us what it was that was so valuable that he was willing to give up everything he had ever worked for in life. And he tells us in verse 8, he says, the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's what he gave up everything for. The surpassing value. Those two English words translate one Greek word. It means to be higher than something else. It, it means something that's worth more than whatever it's being compared to. So Paul is saying that knowing Jesus Christ is worth more than anything else in the world. You've heard me say before, the greatest possible accomplishment that any person can ever have in their lives is not being a star on some sports team. It, it, it's not being successful in business. It's not not even being a sacrificial servant just trying to do for others. The greatest accomplishment any person can possibly have in their life is to know Jesus personally. Paul goes on to expound about the value of knowing Christ in these verses all the way up to and including eternity. <coughs> Paul had literally forsaken the material world and the physical life and all those things that, that we try to have and get and do. And he was living for eternity here on earth because eternity is the only thing that's worth living for. You see, if you're living for money, if you're living for power or popularity or prestige, if you're living for comfort or some philosophy or some religion, for personal security or stability, you're on a no-win track because you can't hold on to those things forever. Even if your life is about helping people, it's about your children or your grandchildren or your neighbors or your friends. If you're helping them to do anything or get anything without making sure that their eternal destiny is with God in heaven, you're really not helping them. You see, the main thing in life is the only thing in life. Knowing Jesus Christ personally. There is no substitute for knowing Jesus personally. I mentioned when we were uh, had the parents and the babies here, this thing called moralistic therapeutic deism. It's a, it's a belief that God exists. But basically, God's only there to get us out of jams. Otherwise, He's not really involved in our lives. And, and all God really wants from us is to be good people. And whoever is a good person is going to end up going to heaven. And if we'll just be good people, God will basically leave us alone, let us live our lives the way we want to. See, that's not an organized religion, but that's how people in America think. By and large, most of the people in America, that's basically their mindset. And that mindset has infiltrated the church. It's alarming that, that most churches, practically all churches, on any given Sunday will have less than half of their members actually present to worship God. Because we're all convinced that we're all okay with God. And I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about all of America. We're all okay with God as long as we don't do anything too bad. Or if we do something really bad, we feel bad about it, and that makes it okay. It's a works-based philosophy, and it has nothing to do with the truth of God's Word. I've said this before, I'm going to say it again, and I'll say it again later too. Christianity is not about being a good person. 
That's not how to be right with God. Christianity is something that should make you a great person. But that's not what it's about. It's about knowing Jesus personally. And when you do know Him personally, when you realize that the Holy Spirit is convicting me that I'm a sinner in need of repentance, and you realize the truth that Jesus really did die for me so my sins can be forgiven, and when you give Him your life, Everything changes. Folks, there are a lot of good people out there that have nothing to do with God or church, and we're not going to out-good people them. We're not going to be good enough people that they're so impressed with us, they say, oh, those are such good people. I just want to go be one of them. It's not going to happen. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested. They're arrested for preaching and they're threatened and, and they're even beaten. And then they send them back to their cell so that the, the council can talk about them. And, and in verse 13 of chapter 4, it says, They took note of these men that they were uneducated, but they had been with Jesus. And what ought to stand out to people is not what good people we are. They ought to be able to see that we have been with Jesus. That, that we know Him personally. You see, that's not only the only way to be saved. It's the only way to know and do God's will. If you hear this message and you think to yourself, oh, I already know Jesus, then you just really don't get it. Don't you think Paul already knew Jesus when he wrote these words? And yet Paul knew he needed to know Jesus better. See, Christianity is more than meeting Jesus one time and, and getting your ticket to heaven and then going about your business. It's yearning and struggling and giving your all to know Him better each day. Can't you see that in Paul's words? As he describes his life. The, the better you know Him, the more you'll be in touch with the Holy Spirit. The more you'll be able to see life from God's perspective and the more you'll be empowered to live the life that He calls you to live. Folks, you will never know and do God's will by trying to be a good person. Our church will never find the courage and the power to move forward doing God-sized things in this community until we give ourselves to knowing Him fully. We worship in hopes that by honoring God as He deserves to be honored, that that will lead us to know Him better. We read our Bibles and we study our Bibles so that we can know Him better. We live our lives every day with the goal of knowing Him better through the things we experience and how we deal with those things. I think too much time and energy and resources are wasted by Christians by holding on to what is less important and at least temporarily letting go of what is most important. We tend to let go of what's important till we get what we want. And then when we have what we want, we try to get back a hold of the important things. I want you to know that if any church is filled with people who are more concerned about anything except knowing Jesus better, that church will never be what it should be. There's no hope of being the church God called it to be. 
Every one of us needs to sit down and ask ourselves this question, how well do I know Jesus? Not do I like the music, not am I impressed with the preaching, not does the building suit me or the, the, the times on our schedule suit me. How well do I know Jesus? And as, after you ask yourself that question and give, you some, give yourself some time to think about it, then ask yourself, how well do I want to know Jesus? And then ask yourself, what am I willing to do to know Him better? Let me tell you, if those questions don't interest you, if those questions make you roll your eyes or yawn or say, yeah, let's get on something else, you really have something to be concerned about. Because there is nothing else that Christianity is about. And we have to get that part straight. And the other things fall into place. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You can't skip the first thing. You can't skip the main thing and just try to be a good person. I want to tell you young people this morning, you have to care more about knowing Jesus than winning your friend's approval or getting attention or being accepted. Because if you leave out knowing Jesus, it just really doesn't matter how good a person you are. And, and I want to tell the adults, you need to care more about knowing Jesus than recapturing the good old days or making sure we sing the songs you like, or making sure that you have your place on your favorite pew, or making sure that you have the Sunday school room you want, or the Sunday school class that you want, or whatever it might be. The only way to live for God is that everything else in your life is at God's pleasure, to give it or take it to increase it or decrease it. It's all in His hands. You're just going to know Jesus as well as you can. This new building that we're talking about, it's, it's going to only be built when we throw off everything else for the sake of knowing Jesus. When we build that building for the purpose of of knowing Him better and leading others to know Him as well. We can't do it by being good people. We will have to be God's people. Walking with Him, led by Him, knowing and doing God's will no matter what. This morning, if you want to be thankful for your mother, be thankful for a mother who told you about Jesus. Be especially thankful for a mother who didn't just tell you about Jesus, but she knew Him and she gave her all to know Him better each day. Parents, if you love your baby, teach him or her to know Jesus personally. The best way to do that is for you to live a life of knowing Him better each day. You moms that are here on Mother's Day, the ones dedicating their children and all the other moms that are here, if you want to be moms who really bless your children, then be a mom who loves God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Listen to this carefully. Putting your baby ahead of God is not loving your baby. But letting your baby see you love God is. You let that baby grow up seeing you know God and love Him and follow Him every day. Tell your baby about His goodness and His greatness. Live a life of gratitude for God's blessing with complete surrender to His will. 
and you make those tough choices that put God first and your baby will take notice what's really important to you. And then when that child is old enough to understand, you lead your child to know Jesus personally. Not based on your faith, but with a faith of her own or of his own. And this goes for every mom and every dad and brother and sister and friend. Every person in this room. Know him. And give your all to knowing Him better. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. That verse is not telling you how you can manipulate God. That verse is telling you how you can let God change you. Because when you delight yourself in Him, you get a new heart and your desires change. And you find that He gives you a life that you can treasure no matter what your circumstances. Jesus warned in the Sermon on the Mount that at the judgment there would be many who stand before God and told God of all of their religious activity and that God would answer them, Depart from me, I never knew you. Whether you're 10 or 100 or, or anywhere in between, no matter how much church you've ever done in your life or how much you haven't done, the only question is do you know Jesus personally? If you can't answer that, yes. Could this be the day that you would put your faith in Him? That you would repent and put your life in His hands? That you would allow Him to change your heart and that you would respond as He leads you to the life He's called you to live? Or maybe this morning you do know Jesus, but you also know that you need to recommit yourself to working at knowing Him better. To live with that focus that a believer should have. To replace that good person Christianity with a full-fledged pursuit of that surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. Maybe today God's adding you to add your membership to our church to bless us and to let us bless you as we all seek to know Him better and to do His will. Or maybe there's another decision that God has laid on your heart. We're going to give you a chance to respond to God. We're going to sing a song, and while we sing that song, you can sing with us, you can pray there where you are, but if God has spoken to you and you know that you need to respond, you come while we sing. Let's all stand. You respond to God if He's spoken.